You are more than welcome to disagree, but if you're going to disagree, at least answer the question first. In discussing the gift that God has given us, there are different sides of the view, which is fine. Problem is, it seems a bit one-sided in our discussions. And what I mean by that is that people want you to answer their question. What does this verse mean? What does that verse mean? And fine, literally have covered every single verse that someone has thrown at me. And we have covered it in even great detail. And when I ask someone to answer these questions, I never get a response. And I'm not going to go to the verses that I go to uh, most often. That would be John 10, 28, John 10, 5, or even, or even Hebrews 13. Won't go there. But what I will do is reiterate a statement that I made in just a community post. Also, even in a short video, I'm going to ask this even more in depth. And I want to walk my way through this, walk you through this so that you can see how this applies to us. If you don't think so, then my only question is, what does it mean? So here, I'm going to ask one more time, in for the love of Jesus, in Jesus' name, would you please, as a good godly Christian who is working their way to learn the scriptures, fight for the scriptures, contend for the faith, to defend the faith, all those things, would you please answer this question? I have asked, what does Jeremiah 32 and 39 and verse 40 means also Ezekiel 36. Typically what I get is someone saying that it means something else and going to other scriptures. Tell me what this passage means. And I, if you are even on the right track, there could be an objection, but the objection is quickly overcome. So when we go to, to Jeremiah 32, 39, first he says, this is God speaking. He says, and I will give them one heart, one way that they may fear me always for their own good and for the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. Now, it's pretty straightforward what he says. Notice again, he says, I will give them one heart and one way. So what is God going to do? God is going to work in their heart. Remember back in in uh, Deuteronomy 10, he tells them to circumcise their heart. They can't. They will not. So 30, he says in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, he says that he will sometime in the future that God will circumcise their heart. So he's speaking about this right now. He says, I will give them one heart. Tell me if you disagree. If you disagree, fine. Tell me what does this mean? He says they may, that they may fear me. How long? Always. Always fear him for their own good, for the good of their children. Look what he says. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Now, so I'm going to say, well, yeah, Corey, the them is Israel. Fine. We'll, di we'll deal with that in just a second. But it says that I will not turn away from them. And also it says they will not turn away from me. So a couple of questions. Whoever the them is, will God ever turn away from them? The answer is no. He says he will not. To say otherwise is to either ignore the scriptures or just to lie or just to play ignorant. He says, I will never turn away from them, nor will they turn away from him. So whoever the them or they are, they will not turn away from him either. Now, some will say, well, yes, Corey, but the them and the they is Israel. You are absolutely correct. He is speaking about Israel. My question is, is Israel going to be the only ones that will not turn away from him? So if you are a Jew who places their faith in Christ, is it such that you are so special that God has caused it to where you will be the only group of Christians who cannot turn away, but the Gentile Christians can. Does that make sense? Is that biblical? No, it's not. And even to state that it's only going to be the Jews, we're going to deal with that in a second. Now, going to Ezekiel 36, what does this passage mean? Figure out what Jeremiah 32, 9, 39, and 40 means. Also, what Ezekiel 36, 25, we've covered this before. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. You will be clean and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. This whole issue of a heart, I will put a new spirit within you and remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Here it is, verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you. So as he says in 32, just like he says in Deuteronomy, I will put my spirit in you, in your heart. And look what he says, cause you to walk in my statutes. What does this mean? If you don't come away with him, if you don't come away, come away with the idea that God has stated that he will put his spirit in your heart and he will cause you to walk in his statutes, the question is, then what does it mean? 
that doesn't mean that he will cause you, that he will make it so that you will walk. That's literally what it says. And to say otherwise would be to ignore them. But what about these other scriptures? Well, we covered these other scriptures. Answer the question. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please, if this is you, answer the question. What does verse 27 mean? Well, Corey, that only applies to Israel. Okay, fine. Notice what he says and notice the elements. I will put water and spirit. I will sprinkle clean water on you. So those two elements, water and spirit, show up. Well, let's go to see if this just is only referring to Israel. Now, it's going to refer to Israel without question. Israel is going to have as a nation, they at some point in time, they are going to have the spirit of the Lord in their heart. All of them, not every single person that's a Jewish person now, but at some point in time, he will cause the, the nation of Israel to do just that because he's going to put their his spirit in their heart and they shall never depart from him. They won't turn away from him and he won't turn away from them. But the question is, is he only going to do that for Israel? Oh, by the way, there are Jews now who are identified as the true Jews, the true Jews of Israel, who also have placed their faith in Christ. People like Paul, people like Peter, those people who have been um, uh, born again by the spirit who according to the scripture says they cannot turn away nor will he turn away from them. But is it, is it only the Jewish Christians who have placed their faith in Christ? Is it only the Jewish members of the church? The church is made up of Jews and Gentiles, all who have placed their faith in Christ. Only one segment of the church will have this ability or inability to turn away. But the rest of us, us Gentiles, we can turn away. Does that make sense? Let's continue. John 3, Jesus brings this whole issue of the heart being changed and he brings the same two elements water and spirit john 3 3 he says unless someone is born again he cannot enter the kingdom of god so the first thing that has to happen for your salvation is you must be born again born from above and then notice what he says in verse 5 because nicodemus is a bit confused thinking it means a second time but no jesus is referring to be born from above born of the spirit he says truly truly i said unless one is born of water and spirit, which is what he said in Ezekiel 36. So unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then he rephrases it. So he says, so he speaks about being born again. Then he says being born uh, of water and spirit. And then the third way he says it is to be born of spirit. He says that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be marvel. Do not marvel or be amazed. I said you must be born again. And notice what he says. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. So Jesus is speaking of people who are born again, who are born of the spirit. And someone might be inclined because they just want to disagree. Say, well, he's just only, he's speaking to a Jew, which he is a Pharisee. He's speaking of Israel. However, Jesus makes, makes a statement also, uh, John, I'm sorry, John 1 12 says, but as many as received him, he gave the right to, uh, he gave the right to become children of God, even those who believe in his name. So those who are believing in his toys, uh, pistusin, those are, that is the present active participle. So those, those plural folks who are constantly in a state of believing. So those, even those who are believing in his names, who are these people, he says, who were born, the same word that's used, born here, born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men. But what were they born of? They were born of God. They were born of his will. And the same word that's used for born from the Greek word, uh, genomai, if we go back to John 3, the same word born is from the same word. Look at the bottom. This is the same word, the Greek word, genomai. And so the same people who we speak of in John 3, who are born of the spirit that Ezekiel spoke about, that Jeremiah spoke about, that Deuteronomy spoke about, Jesus says, the Bible says in John 1, that those very same people, all of those are us, whoever has been born, including, and so this word, going back to John 1, this word is all inclusive, but as many, this Greek word right here to the right, this word hasoi. So whoever it is, all the ones that happen to have been born of the spirit, God gave them the ability, the power to be sons and children of God. Now, how does this work? Well, remember, God has stated that he is going to cause Israel to be jealous. In, in doing so, he's going to bring them back. But how is he going to cause them to be jealous? He's going to, as, as the Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, 21, he says that they have made me jealous with, with what is not of God. And they have provoked, provoked me to anger with idols. So look what God says he's going to do. I will make them jealous. I will make them. He's going to cause them to be jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Who is that? That is the Gentiles. So what is he going to do with the Gentiles? 
the very same thing that he's going to do with the, with the Jews eventually. That is, he's going to put his spirit in their heart. How do we know that's the case? So if we go to 1 Peter 1, 3, notice what he says about us who are born again. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, notice what he says. He says, he has caused us to be born again. God is the one who caused us. He caused us. You didn't do it. So God caused us. Who's he referring to? Is he referring to just Jews? No, he's not. He's referring to everyone who has been born again, everyone who is part of the church. Now, even to make this point even more so, 1 John 5, he says, whoever believes, so he, now the word whoever is actually not there. It says, pas ha pistuan, so all the believing ones, all of those who are believing, that's you and I, whether you be Jew or Gentile, all of those who are believing, notice what he says, they have been born. Gegenetai, which is the same Greek word that's used in being born again in, in John 1 and John 3, is from the same word, genomai, uh, those who, uh, who have been born of God and who love the Father, love the children of God, they love us, they, we love each other. And notice what he says, we go down to verse, verse 4. He says, so whatever, and then the word is hatipan, so all the ones that have been born of God, they overcome the world. We have this victory based on our faith. Now, where did the faith come from? Remember, who caused us to be born again in the first place? Peter says it's God. Jesus says you have to be born of the Spirit. Ezekiel says that it is born from those who have been born because God puts his Spirit in them. And so, going back to the original question, you got to answer that question. If a person can walk away, can turn away, and, and Jeremiah has to be inclusive of not just what he's going to do with Israel, but obviously what he's going to do with Gentiles alike, if his spirit is in us, doesn't he say in Jeremiah 32, 39 and 40, that he will never turn away from us? Isn't that not what he says? And is it also stating that we will never turn away from him? If you disagree, well, then fine, fine. That's OK. You can disagree, but do it biblically. Don't go to 18 other different scriptures, which, by the way, again, we've all wait. We've, we've asked before. We'll answer again. But would you please? just for intellectual honesty, just for the sake of being a good brother or sister, answer the question. See, this is why Paul makes a statement in Philippians 1, 6. He says, for I am confident of this very thing. What thing are you confident of, Paul? He says that he, who's the he, ladies and gentlemen? That's God. God who began, he began a good work in you, will perfect it. This Greek word right here, epitelese, which is from the Greek word to perfect, to complete, to perform. He will complete it, perfect it until the day of Christ. Now, I want you to focus on a word, another word that I have underlined, this word, until, this word, akri. So if someone wants to tell you that he'll do so once you get to heaven, once you make it to the eternal state, nope, that's not what it says. It says until, let's put it back on the screen, until the day of Christ. So this is prior to you making it to that internal state. So he will complete, he'll perfect it. So he'll keep you, he'll keep completing you. He'll keep working in you. He will make it so even up to the day of Christ. Once you're saved, once you're there, then you're there. And so it would be difficult for someone to say, and oh, by the way, while you're answering questions, answer that one. Why would Paul make the statement that he is confident that he will complete it? Who will complete it? The very one that began it in you began what? The salvation. So the very one that began this salvific work in you, Paul says emphatically, because he says, I'm confident that he will complete it until the day of Christ to give you confidence. Again, if you disagree, let me put it back on the screen again. Jeremiah 32, 39 and 40, mainly 40. I will put an everlasting, make an everlasting covenant with them and I will not turn away from them and they will not turn away from me. What does that mean if you disagree? Ezekiel 36, verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. What does that mean? I know you're going to say Israel. Tell me how the same thing doesn't apply to the church as well, to the church believers, the, the, the Gentile believers. So that's the case. If it only applies to the Jewish believers, well, then God has a special class of people who will only be saved completely. Uh, that makes no sense. They can't turn away, but we can. So, Answer the question, please. I look forward to hearing your, your, your attempt at it. You're not going to be able to answer this question in any other way other than what it simply says. So if you disagree, that's fine, but do so with the scriptures. In other words, answer the question, please.